graduate. Last week, he graduated from the Baptist Theological uh, Program. And Adam is continuing on with more theological education as you and I continue today with Luke chapter 9. Looking at Luke chapter 9 in your sermon notes, you will see the outline. We began looking at several of these sections in July. We took a pause. Uh, Today we are finishing up another one of the sections in Luke chapter 9 and then looking forward to January as we will continue with this series. Have you ever had to learn a new language in order to learn, in order to live in your new country? Anybody else in this in the room had the same experience? And as I was standing in a completely modern electronic equipment facility, completely modern, they sold computers and tablets and washing machines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. as I approached the cashier practicing my new language, I asked her, may I pay with little potatoes? And she was a gracious young cashier, and she looked at me and just paused, and I thought about what I said. In fairness, in the language that I was trying to speak, little potato is close to credit card. I know it doesn't sound that way in English, but I paused and said, probably not. May I use a credit card? And she said, yes, yes. (laughs) We are a modern store. We do not barter here. It is a new situation. In Luke chapter 9, verse 43b, going through verse 45, today we see that Jesus again foretells his death. And the problem is we didn't understand. In the sermon notes today, you will see three self reflection questions. The self-reflection questions, number one, am I being transformed by God's Word or am I merely gaining more and more information about God? In 1 Corinthians, the problem with the Corinthian church is that one person followed this and one person followed another. And Paul said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We didn't understand when Jesus declared what we will read today. Or do I attend worship for my needs to be met? Or do I attend worship to express my praise to the Lord? When I finish the service, I am exactly like you. When I finish the service, there is one person and one person only that I needed to encounter. Who do you need to encounter today? There is one and one person only. And if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you might have a wonderful experience, but you don't understand worship yet. And a third question, am I confused by what Christ is calling me to understand As we've gone through Luke chapter 9, it's an amazing chapter full of information that we take for granted, but it was transformational as it was first given. There was a time that a test pilot, Chuck Yeager, discovered something that had gone unnoticed. They were testing new jets, and unfortunately, five or six of these jets had crashed. And Chuck Yeager, as he was testing the new jet, he got to a certain maneuver and he discovered that he too was having the same problem. But instead of crashing, he came down. And when they examined the airplane, they saw that the engineer had correctly drawn the plans for the new plane. But you know when you and I fly on a plane and there's the huge wings? You know sometimes there are those small little flaps Within the, within the wing. The wing itself is fine. But they discovered that an engineer, the plans said, you must put the bolt in upside down. But the engineer do his business. I mean, excuse me, the engineer correctly said the bolt must be put upside down. But the maintenance workers, they knew their business. 
They knew bolts. They knew airplanes. They knew their job. This is ridiculous. You don't put bolts upside down. So they put the bolts the other way. And that led to the crashing of five or six planes. We see things in Scripture that sometimes we do not understand. The Bible says, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. And it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. All of Luke chapter 9 is an amazing chapter. That first section when Jesus gives the disciples the ability to preach the gospel and to heal people. And as they went out, and as they were so effective that we looked in the second section, that Herod the ruler was perplexed. And he saw something wonderful, but he didn't truly understand what Jesus Christ was all about. And so he wanted to meet Jesus to see if Jesus could perform a trick. And the irony when we looked at Jesus feeding the 5,000, the name of the place doesn't mean much to us, but the literal name of the place that's listed in the Bible, it can be translated various ways, but one of the translations could be fish market or fish town or fish harbor. It can be translated, but it's connected to fish. And the 5,000 people were living in a city that the very name of the city had a connection with fish. And yet the disciples said, Jesus... We don't have anything to feed. And we know the rest of the story. And how for the early Christians before the cross, the fish was the symbol of Christianity. And in verse 18, the very first time that Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, they had been looking for 400 years for the Messiah to come but they had never thought that the Messiah would be divine. And to this day, the Jewish people are not looking forward to a divine Messiah. There is only one God. And we sing, we proclaim enthusiastically as Christians, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ His Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And we understand that logically these are contradictory. And people don't understand how can you have one God and still proclaim the Trinity. And yet we know that that was the power of Peter declaring you are the Christ. And then the first time Jesus tried to explain, you have a picture of me that I'm going to usher in an earthly kingdom. I am, in fact, the Messiah, but it's not going to be like that. And the first time he tried to explain to the disciples that he was going to suffer, but there was no way that they could understand. And he went on to explain to you and I that if we are to be his followers, that we must also take up our cross. And then we saw the transfiguration, and our minds can only imagine How beautiful that scene was on the dark night that suddenly it was illuminated and Moses and Elijah were there talking with Jesus. His own disciples didn't know how to talk to Him about what was about to happen. And so God miraculously provided Moses and Elijah so that in His deepest moment of need, there could be somebody who joined with Him. And you and I know that emotion. We haven't faced the transfiguration. But you and I have been at our moment of deepest need. And we've tried to explain to someone what we're going through. And we are so tremendously blessed by our Heavenly Father when He gives us someone to go along with us and just talk about the situation. And then, of course, last week, 
as we saw that Jesus healed the boy with the unclean spirit. But then today, for the second time, he foretells his death. And he said, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered. It will be several months from now. It will be January before we read the next section. But our hearts break because Jesus has just poured out his heart about what was going to happen to him. And the next thing we see is that the disciples started debating who was the greatest among themselves. You've had that moment in your life. You faced something that was incredibly important. You needed someone to stand beside you. But they were so concerned about their own needs that they talked to you about how the washing machine was broken and there was water everywhere in the floor. And your heart was broken. And your life blood symbolically was everywhere in the floor. We understand that in our life, there are life-changing moments. And there are some principles for us to remember when these life-changing moments occur. Number one, you and I experience life-changing moments at an unexpected time. That sounds like an obvious statement. But some of the most significant things that have ever happened in your life were at a completely unexpected time. There was a beautiful woman by the waterfalls in Turkey. Wow. And she's now seated here on the front row. It was just going to be to go see the sights. And boy, did I. Some of the most important things that will ever happen in your life positively will be at an unexpected time. As Jesus has healed this boy, as a family has been reunited, as a father embraces his only son who has now miraculously been healed, Jesus shares the second time with them some news that is life-changing news. And that life-changing news came at an unexpected time. Number two, life-changing moments give us unexpected information. The best way to teach somebody something, this has been scientifically proven. This is going to be so deep, you might want to write this down. If you want an adult to dramatically increase their knowledge, write this down. Here's the number one thing to do. Give them a new job. They will be so overwhelmed that they will be grasping for every bit of information that they can grab. Life-changing moments happen this way for us. Jesus, discla- Jesus declares to the disciples for a second time, an unexpected time, unexpected information. And then we'll go on to number three. That in life-changing moments we find ourselves often without understanding. And without understanding, a new situation causes confusion. As you and I travel to new cities, as we learn new methods of public transportation, as we learn the right way to shake hands, which way does the head go? You can smack somebody in the forehead when that was not your intention. When you get hired at a new place, there's often a mentoring program to help you come along. But without understanding, a new situation causes confusion. And then number four, in life-changing moments, often... We are afraid. And fear keeps us from having crucial conversations. Excellent book that I've read during the past several years 
the title of the book is Crucial Conversations. It's completely a business book. It is not from the Bible. It is not a devotional. It is not anti-biblical. But it's purely from the secular business world. But the premise within Crucial Conversations is that within our families, within our homes, within our workplaces, we do not have crucial conversations, and primarily it's because we do not feel safe. Now, every husband and wife, whether they admit it or not, understands what I'm talking about. Because after being married for a very short time, they stop having conversations. And it's over trivial things. Do you want to go to Burger King or do you want to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken? Do you want to have Pizza Hut or McDonald's? It's trivial. And in your heart, you know what you want. But you've been down this road before. You've had this conversation before. And so you're just not going to bring it up. Dear, where would you like to eat this afternoon? Everything within your heart screams Burger King. Your experience has taught you don't say it. You might be a man, but you are a fear. You're fearful. There are conversations that you need to have with your child, but you're afraid how the conversation is going to go. There are conversations that you need to have at the workplace. But you know how the boss is going to react because that's how he's always reacted. We are afraid. And without security in the relationship, there are crucial conversations that we need to have, but we do not have them. Because we are afraid. In life changing moments, they happen to us at unexpected times. They give us unexpected information. And without understanding, it leads to confusion. And we find ourselves having fear. And therefore, we don't have the conversation that we need to have. Some people might sit in a diverse international church, but in eternity they will awake to hell because they were afraid to ever take that step of asking Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior. Sunday after Sunday, as they came to the worship service, if they looked at these same self-reflection questions, they knew what they needed to do. But everyone knew that they were a good person. And if they now admitted that they had never asked Jesus Christ to be their personal Lord and Savior, that would be so embarrassing. And so because of fear... They don't take the step. You and I in our marriages, because of fear, don't have the conversation that we know that we need to have with our spouse. You and I with our children don't have the conversation that we know that we need to have. And Sunday after Sunday, We're given the opportunity, and yet, because of fear, we turn the opportunity aside. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have this amazing passage. In Isaiah chapter 3, we read a portion of it earlier, Adam did for us, but now if we look at the entire chapter, we see the words, who has believed what he has heard from us? 
verse 1, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Peter declared, Jesus, you are the Christ. And Jesus knew that the disciples had no idea what they were talking about. And he tried to explain that yes, He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God, that He did nothing of His own, that He only acted as the Father told Him to act. And still, the disciples didn't understand the suffering that is involved in following Christ. Surely, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. It is by his wounds. It is by your wounds that others will be healed. It is by your distress that others will receive comfort. It is by your sacrifice that others will know the truth about Jesus Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. That is our selfish human condition. Every one of us in this room thinks about ourselves first. It's just the way we are. But it's not an excuse. Because while it is true, it's just the way we are, it is not the way we may be. We may be so much better than we are by our natural, fleshly nature. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so He opened not His mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And we've read in other passages that even now, Christ is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. It's been said before, but please allow me to repeat it. In order to make pearls, an oyster must undergo pain. 
And in a beautifully symbolic way, the Bible tells us that the gates of heaven are made out of pearl. In Luke chapter 18, verse 31 and 34, we will see that Jesus foretold his death a third time. And still, his disciples didn't understand. Our final slide today. We didn't understand. We thought the Christian life was supposed to be different from this. We didn't understand that God would call us to something so difficult or so challenging. We didn't understand the depths of our Savior's suffering for us. We, we didn't understand all that He was trying to explain. We didn't understand. But the question now is, do we now? As God speaks to your heart today, even as a child, you might know that your destiny will be in a foreign land. Because from a young age, God speaks to some children. And from a young age, they know that they will carry the good news of Jesus Christ to a different land. As God speaks to your heart today, you know if you need to accept Christ as your Savior. You have a lot of knowledge about Him, but you've never actually accepted Him as your Savior. As God speaks to your heart today, you know if He's calling you to make some kind of other decision. As we kneel beneath the shadow of the cross, do we understand what Christ is calling us to do? Let's pray.